Welcome to this week's episode of the Mixtape with Scott. Uh, this is your host, Scott Cunningham. I'm a professor of economics at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. This week is uh, a guest uh, that I've, whose work I've admired for a long time. His name's Sasha Becker. He's a professor at uh, Monash University in Australia, Melbourne, Australia. I saw him present last year at a conference where I was a keynote um, in, uh, in Melbourne. And um, it was really exciting because I had uh, I was familiar with his work. Uh, I was familiar with specifically his work in economic history and religion. And um, to get to meet him in person was really neat. And he's just, he was just a phenomenal uh, presenter and just such a passionate presenter and a passionate person and very intelligent. And the work was so meticulous and so deep that um, I've been wanting to interview him for a long time. And um, so I was was able to now. Um, the interview was really interesting. It, I hope that you like it. It kind of personal in, at a personal level. It was interesting to hear some of the things he said because it some of the things he said about sort of I guess you might call the sociology of the spread of causal inference. Uh, he shares uh, the exact conjecture that I've had for over a decade which was um, that causal inference spread uh, what we would consider spread throughout um, economics, not through econometrics textbooks, because there weren't any, um, but rather really through the students of some of these people, uh, like Josh Anger's students, Hito's, Hito, Hito Emben's students, David Card's students, uh, through Princeton students, through uh, at that top. And those students oftentimes were applied microeconomists as opposed to theoretical econometricians, although there were those too. And, um, and if that conjecture's right, then um, you should have probably seen a lot of positive selection as it as you can imagine, Josh Anger's students at MIT or Card students at Berkeley uh, or Emben's students at Harvard. And then he goes to Berkeley and then, you know, then he, he goes to UCLA. Uh, you could just sort of imagine those students are phenomenal and they end up themselves going to top universities. And so you just sort of see a segment, a, a bifurcation of the, of the labor market, you might say, where these ideas are sort of staying in a certain world for a little while till this till mostly harmless probably uh comes out and then there's a group of workers who may not have had access to it even though they're learning econometrics and you might say they're applied so or they are applied so it was kind of interesting he articulated it exactly and this whole time i've just thought that you know i'm not saying i'm the only one who thought that way but actually had never met anyone that thought that way but it was interesting to hear sasha kind of independently just suddenly start saying it and I just was validated. So anyway, it was a really fascinating interview. I loved it. Um, it was a pleasure to meet him. He's a very, very, very intelligent and passionate man, but very humble and very nice. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I hope you enjoy this. And thanks so much for listening. If you do value these this podcast, uh, please tell people about it. Uh, share this. Tell people about it. I hope that the personal stories of economists are things that really resonate with you. And uh, and uh, I hope this continues to sort of help build the collective story of the profession. Uh, see you later. Okay. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to have my guest here uh, this week on the show. Uh, this is, um, we've met before, but we've never spoken as much as I'm looking forward to. So if you, the I'm going to ask the guest, uh, would you mind telling us your name, your title, uh, and uh, who pays your paycheck? <laughs> uh, my name is Sasha Becker, and I'm currently the Chao Ka Yang Chair of Business and Economics and Professor of Economics at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm also part-time professor at the University of Warwick in Coventry in the UK. Awesome. Sasha, it's so nice to have you on the um, podcast. Um, well, so uh, why don't we get started? So just as an icebreaker, would you mind telling me what's a vacation that you went on as a kid 
that to this day you sort of still think about from time to time? Well, I guess what characterizes all our vacations uh, is that we always went by train because my dad mm. worked for the German railway. So wherever we went, it had to be within reach by train. We never mm. took a plane anywhere. I took my first plane flight when I was, I guess, 18 or 19 and went with a mate uh, to Ireland. <laughs> um, and the one situation that I remember is when I was maybe five or six and we were uh, in the south of Germany at one of Germany's biggest lake, uh, Lake uh, Bodensee, Lake Constance, where I think I was uh, a bit fearful of jumping into the lake from a little jetty. And my dad then offered me two Deutschmarks if I overcome my fear. And that seems to have been enough to make me jump. <laughs> <laughs> upward sloping supply curves is that that's yeah. it <laughs> well yeah. well so where did you grow up and what did you, you said your dad you said your dad worked for the railroads yeah that's correct so oh. yeah i i'm an only child my parents both have relatively basic schooling my dad went to school for eight years my mom went to school for 10 years, so I don't have any academics in my mm. uh, ancestry. Mm. And that defines also a lot of my trajectory as uh, that we will be talking about. So I grew up in a town called Ida Oberstein, mm. which nowadays has 25,000 inhabitants or so. Mm. And it's in the west of Germany, not too far from the French and the Luxembourg border. Hmm. And uh, the funny thing that we maybe also will touch on later is one of the people that also went to that same high school in the middle of nowhere is Petra Moser, who is at NYU Stern. Oh, yeah. And she also works in economic history, as I do. Um, and what's funny about it, there was no economics in school. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was the subject. But the two of us within just two cohorts both ended up becoming academic economists working on economic history. Wow. So y'all were friends? Yeah. I mean, she is two years older. Um, so we didn't interact much at school really, but uh -huh. uh, still it's, uh, it's a funny little coincidence. That is yeah. a funny coincidence because it's such a small town. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So if y'all talk, do y'all, are y'all, uh close now you you're yeah 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 oh very that's cool. that's yeah. very cool that's very cool uh so your dad he worked for the railroad what what was he doing for the railroad well he really worked his way up over time he started uh an apprenticeship when he was age 13 just before his 14th birthday and then he would just work locally in the railway station in in Ida Oberstein selling tickets. And then over time, he did all kinds of uh, additional training courses and worked his way up to uh, places higher up in the railway administration and ended up in his last years of work in Mainz, which is 100 kilometers away from Ida Oberstein, mm -hmm. so a bigger town. <clears throat> but he would always commute there because he never even considered leaving uh, the place he lived in. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah. And your mom, what did you say your mom did? Well, I, she was uh, for some time working in a bank, but from the day I was born, she uh, stayed home because that was uh, her passion to look after her only son. Mm. And she never really returned to work after that. Mm. So you were close. She then at some point got breast, breast cancer and oh. life became a little bit complicated. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, so what kind of games did you play as a kid in that, in that little town? Well, <clears throat> one passion we had uh, in our group of boys, I guess, was table tennis and mm -hmm. mini golf. And at, uh, and at some point we also played tennis and squash. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. 
And so then you go to high school. You said there's no economics in high school. Was it a bit? So I guess it wasn't a very big school though, with a being a smaller town. Yeah, it it was compared to U.S. schools I've seen, um, relatively small, say. Uh, so in our graduating cohort, we were fifty. I don't know how that compares to a typical U.S. high school. And so we didn't have economics. We had something like uh, social sciences. Yeah. Um, so broad brush, quick ride through the big names, whatever Marx and uh, Durkheim, maybe is names we would touch on, but we didn't go into any detail really on, yeah. on most of these things. Yeah. 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 So what, what was what what? uh classes were you did you like the most back then well i i always loved mathematics and history and um, then when it came to choosing a university subject again the fact that my parents had no academic background whatsoever Mm -hmm. and this was the pre-internet age 1992 i finished high school it meant you would kind of send letters to universities asking for brochures. Uh, and um, the reason I ended up in Bonn, um, which is a great university for both mathematics and economics, was really coincidental. My grandma was living there and uh, that meant uh, I could stay for free. There were no rental costs. And given that we uh, were rather a lower middle class type of family yeah um, couldn't afford uh, paying uh, rent in a big city yeah uh, so i ended up in bonn really only because my grandma was there yeah. and it wasn't really much of an academic choice and i was more surprised as i then learned and i started with mathematics and physics um, that uh, it was one of the best universities in the country um, uh-huh. for these subjects so yeah a lot of in my life was accidental say. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the David Card, uh, college in the County story where he, yeah. where he is you're going to the, well, uh, so you start off in, uh, math and physics, but do you, is that, do those remain your major throughout the whole college experience? No, again. So the thing is I started mathematics and physics to become a school teacher. And that was following my dad's very strong advice that, uh, to have a safe job and a safe income in life, I should become a civil servant and go mm-hmm. into the public school system. And that sounded quite reasonable. And I didn't have much other advice at the time. Um, yeah. and so I started that. But then already in the first weeks of study, I met uh, an economist um, who is now a professor in Zurich, uh, Matthias Hoffmann, Mm. who already was in his third year of economics and he studied mathematics for fun on the side. Ah. Mm. Um, And then we would do these exercise sheets together day and night, really, there were so many. (laughs) And... I always found he had an amazing intuition for stuff, whereas Mm. for me, it it always was try mathematics. And so we were doing stuff on differential equations and so on. And for me, that was mathematics. And he always saw applications and that fascinated Mm. me somehow. Mm. So one day I would just go along with him to some economics lectures. Oh, And I found that so fascinating that over time I slowly moved. So I, I first added economics to the pile and did a bit of both. And at some point I realized I can't study three subjects in parallel. Um, so then I stopped mathematics and physics after two years and only went with econ. Oh, so was there, so it was this friend, this friend that really got you hooked on economics. Yeah. 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 And again, uh, an accidental thing more or less. Yeah. 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 So, so when you, uh, was it just, what was it about, what was it about economics at the very beginning that you just found yourself sticking with it? Why, why, why is it that you ended up liking it? I think it was also just the quality of lectures and the passion people had for it. Um, 
And I saw it in these early days as applied mathematics. Yeah? And only over time, I, I saw it as a standalone subject. Yeah, But since my original passion was for mathematics, um, there was this applied mathematics angle. But again, something that's very peculiar in the German system is that you sometimes have these uh, kind of substitute professors. So there may be a chair of economics and that's currently vacant and they are looking for a permanent hire and given German bureaucracy that can take one or two years. And in the meantime, they hire someone to be the substitute shareholder. Oh. At the time when I was taking these lectures, the, the micro lectures were given by Kai Konrad, mm. who um, was one of the best published rising stars in the German scene back then. Mm. And macro finally was Harald Ulick, yeah, who then uh, went on to Humboldt University and now is in Chicago. Mm. So I had these guys um, when they were in their 30s yeah, or mm. late 20s, even or early 30s. And they had been trained extremely well. They were passionate about economics and they were very untypical of the, 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 the German professor who is an old white haired 55 <laughs> to 65 year old guy. Yeah. And so that probably um, sparked my interest in economics as a subject in itself. Mm, mm, mm. That's great. Well, so was it was it one particular field at, in college that you were being drawn to? Or was it just you loved all of it? Um, there, there wasn't anything specific. I but I was drawn to people who were kind of out of the box. And I, I was truly fascinated by Reinhard Selten, yeah? so Germany's only ever Nobel laureate in, mm -hmm. in economics. And he was just an amazing human being as well. So he was giving a lecture on bounded rationality mm -hmm that I attended in 1994. And um, that was at a time when these topics weren't yet mainstream. Um, and it, it was maybe the early days of behavioral economics, but it's not really my area. So, but I, I, I liked the way he was so meticulous. He, he, he would still do old style, writing on the board with chalk, mm. going slowly, explaining stuff and, uh, the teaching loads in Germany for full professors are like completely crazy, 240 hours a year. Mm -hmm. And he would on top of that, because he was passionate, a passionate teacher, he would attend all the tutorials as well and mm -hmm. look over the shoulders of the students. So he did far more than he was ever expected to do just because he liked teaching and wanted students to fully understand stuff and right. that always impressed me uh, with him mm. um, mm. mixed with his absolutely outstanding humility yeah so mm. if you have 30 seconds for that story when he won the nobel prize bonn at the university they have this funny thing that there is a back entrance for the uh, professors there is like a special corridor that the academics used to enter the lecture hall while the students come from the backside and go down the stairs into the, the hall. So the day he won the Nobel Prize, he had a lecture in the afternoon um, and that wasn't cancelled. There was no way he would cancel a lecture. Mm. So everyone was in that lecture hall. The, the, the corridors was, were f spilling over. There were people everywhere on the stairs. There were hundreds of people in that lecture hall and all around. And then he entered from the back door and there were standing ovations. The whole room was like clapping like crazy for five minutes in a row. And when finally the clapping subsided, he was initially standing there just with an open mouth staring into the void. And um, when the clapping subsided, he just said, now we can start, turned round and started writing on the board. 
No <laughs> word like thank you. I'm I, I'm so moved. But he just uh, wanted back to business. You know, yeah. for him that was the thing. He came to give a lecture, and he would give a lecture. Yeah? <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. So how old were you? What what grade? What what year were you when you, you saw that happen? That was my. I was twenty one or so. So my it was my second or third year of being a student, but in yeah. economics, maybe my second or third semester, given that I started that a bit later. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you saw that. So you saw that happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's... I was there. It, it still is burned in my mind. Wow. This absolute humility. And he didn't change an inch after that. You know, oh. and so many Nobel laureates from then on only uh, travel the world, cash in, give lectures to big audiences. He would just do his thing. He also one day a week did home office in order to clean the house. His wife was um, mm. somewhat handicapped, I think, mm. and he refused to hire a cleaning woman. And instead, it was his ethic that he would do that. Mm. Of course, spent this day with his wife. And this humanity always stood out to me as something so special. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he sounds amazing. That's, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's very, that mu did that have, did that have an effect on where, how you wanted to spend your life in economics, just seeing him like that? I think it had many effects that only over time I realized. And, uh, one of it was given that he seemed to have such clear principles in life, Mm. about how he saw himself and mm. what it means to be a good person for want of a better word it was clear to me that i would listen to his advice um if he was so so kind to share it with me so one thing that then also had uh, effects on my further career i would say is uh, the university of bonn had two exchange programs um that were quite competitive to get in. One were, was to UC Berkeley, and one was with uh, NSAE, which is the École Nationale de la Statistique et de l'Administration Économique, so a, a grand école in Paris, one of the big schools. Um, and I wanted to apply for this semester away or a year away, um, and Typically, everyone applied to Berkeley, yeah, no, um, because Berkeley was like Berkeley. Yeah? In terms of university, it, it seemed so, so clearly to uh, top uh, a French grand école. Mm -hmm. So I went to him to ask him whether he would write me a reference letter. And the rule of the game was you could only apply either to Berkeley or to Paris, but not both. Yeah, So yeah. I asked him if what should I do? Should I apply to Berkeley or to Paris? And I think I thought he would probably say Berkeley. Why not? I mean, <laughs> it's so obvious. Um, but he said, look, I think you should swim against the river. That is the German expression translated to English, and probably it's slightly different in English. You should swim against the river. Everyone wants to go to Berkeley. You should go to Paris. And then he gave these quasi prophetic words if life wants you will go to berkeley later yeah. so i applied for paris i got in and uh, spent my last year of studies abroad in paris and he was right because then during my phd studies i did go to berkeley for a term and spent five months with david cart and ah. that's where our lifelines met yeah. oh wow wow Wow. So you go to Paris school. Well, I want to hear both of those stories. So you end up going to Paris. What, uh, what was it like as a student at Paris? I've never spoken to a, I, I actually don't know a lot about a lot about Paris school of economics. Yeah. What was it like? Um, it was great. I mean, there were three or four of us from Bonn that went and we were a group that also did a lot of stuff together. Um, mm. 
So this being a grand école, um, so it's not the Paris School of Economics, but uh, they call the National de Statistique, uh, ENSAE. Mm. Um, they were also very techy. Yeah, so mm. a lot of the students there had, had an extremely strong math background. So there, there would be courses like stuff on Brownian motions and finance. So you would have relatively techy subjects. Yeah. Um, and the, the kind of strange thing, given my math background, is I did best in the more verbal subjects, where as a foreigner, I should be disadvantaged. Yeah? But it seemed to be the case that French students, relatively speaking, had all formulas in their head programmed. Yeah? Whereas in German universities, you always allowed to bring your formula booklet, like whatever the Pythagorean theorem, okay, that one I would know, but uh, all these cosine theorems. Um, whereas in France, you have to memorize them. Yeah? Ah. Um, you have to know that. Uh, and that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in these kind of subjects, I sometimes struggled with certain sub exercises. Um, and in the more verbal ones, I did extremely well. So that's one thing I remember. And also, um, these grand écoles are kind of a group of universities by themselves yeah, that see themselves as elite schools. So there was a squash league and a rugby league just for these schools. And mm -hmm. they did not play against the state universities, but these elite schools would do their own sports leagues. Um, and I also played in a squash team for the NSO team. And we had stuff like a wine lovers club and a museum club. So they had lots of these clubs which wasn't a thing in German universities really at the time. Mm, mm, mm. So you, you, uh, so you're, you're, you're at Paris. Do you, it's a very, it's a very technical program. Is that, is that what you're saying? It's very technical. And what about, so, you know, you, you I noticed one of your most cited papers is um, it's in state, a journal, uh, and it's, it's all on average treatment effects. And so now I'm just kind of making this link. Now you, you go to Berkeley and you're with card. Are you sort of getting as a visitor, as a visitor, as yeah? a so visitor, a right. PhD there, yeah. Right. And so are you getting, uh, at your visit with card, are you sort of getting some of this causal inference kind of experience or is that something that you know, where did you first start kind of picking that up? Yeah, no, that started earlier. So I then finished my um, diploma, which is somewhere halfway between a master's and a bachelor in Bonn in 1997. And de mm. facto on the ground, I was in Paris uh, because that was my last year of study that was counted at Bonn. Um, from there, I go to EY in Florence and that is the biggest credit program in the social sciences in all of Europe, mm. um, Italy, and brings together students from all across Europe. And there, one of my teachers is Andrea Ikino, who uh, oh, yeah. had just joined. I think in the first year I was there, he was still on a kind of postdoc position. Mm. And then from 1998, he is a full professor. So while he's there, he applies for this full time job and gets it. And he had done the PhD at MIT and mm. um, must have overlapped with Angrist because the microeconometrics, the way he taught it at the time, I think was so out of the box and he may have been the first in Europe. It would be interesting to try to trace that. Who was teaching this local average treatment effect? Ah. Um, so, in 1998, I yeah. sat through this course and there was no textbook at the time. Yeah. So there was no mostly harmless econometrics. There was nothing of that style, right. but his lecture notes had all the material that then years later we would see in mostly harmless econometrics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, uh, he taught that year after year. So I think he, he trained generations of 
economists in this stuff before it became kind of the standard material in mm. PhD programs. He goes to Europe from yeah. MIT carrying with him some yeah. of that angriest, angriest uh, style yeah. work. Wow. And also Josh would visit UI. So while I was there, Josh came to teach short courses. Also Guido Imbens came. So these mm. guys would, would give short courses to students, exposing them to their latest thinking. Yeah. And I'm not sure in how many other European places at the time they would give these courses, but clearly given Ikino's links uh, yeah. with them personally, yeah. it was the opening the door to these developments in wow. at least in Florence. Yeah. 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 So I mean you're young and you're probably not necessarily uh, I'm just thinking out loud, if you're young and this is your first exposure to microeconometrics, it might not seem as though it's necessarily, you know, unique, I guess. I mean, but did you get a set, were you sort of uh, intrigued by it in a way that you sort of look back and notice it, it was, had an impact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was clear is there were only these lecture notes. Yeah. So yeah. in all the other subjects, there was there a textbook. Books. There was a yeah? textbook, right. And um, Ikino always said, well, I would like to point you to something, but this is all I have. It, right. It's super fresh. It's uh, cutting edge stuff to some mm. extent. And again, look, this was pre-internet. It's not like you would constantly get the latest working papers into your inbox. Yeah. So knowledge transfer yeah. um, in these days pre-internet or early days of internet relied even more on, on the knowing yeah. the people who were yeah. developing stuff, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's been my conjecture uh, for years is that that is exactly my conjecture that I've been saying to people forever, which is that there that this spread of causal inference, because it didn't move through the textbooks and it moved through more of the applied econometrician or the applied worker, it moved through the labor markets more than it moved yeah. through the 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 books yeah. yeah so you feel that way too absolutely absolutely wow. i think wow. without these personal links i would not have been exposed to that in those calendar years 1997 mm. 98 99 wow and then ikino would teach the local level treatment effect stuff but also matching and back in these yeah. days everyone did matching yeah in, in my cohort i guess all the applied people were using matching estimators and that mm. was seemed to be the future yeah you only yeah. need to do careful matching and you get at causality you know? right right and this is also what then propelled us to write this data code because back then there was no code yeah and um we worked on that um for one or two years wow wow because, um, we had no idea that this accompanying paper in the Stator Journal would be so highly cited. Yeah. I find it crazy that still today it collects hundreds of sites every year because in some pockets of uh, the scientific community, uh, matching is still in its heyday, like yeah. medical sciences. I think lots right. of citations are still going there. Yeah. Uh, whereas in econ, it, it then crashed completely after yeah. some years. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Maybe now it's seeing a little bit of a resurgence with uh, the, the work by King and cause and exact matching. Or it's maybe one little appendix table where you also show, by the way, if I do a careful matching, I find something similar. Right. But back then, it was the way to cause mm. an inference in, the, wow. in our minds. Yeah? And then based on that paper and the code, just immediately after I got out of the PhD and uh, went to Munich for my first job, mm. I would then get invitations to teach courses. So um, in in the 2000s and early 2010s, I gave, I think, 20 to 25 PhD courses across Europe mm. in seven or eight different countries. And originally it was always um, 
we want something, uh, someone to teach us matching. Yeah, that was ah. what people cared about most. Yeah, but I always said, look, you should also under try to understand IV and right. uh, not just IV as a press the button methodology, but the philosophy behind it. What am I identifying? What are the causal parameters and all of that? Yeah. Um, and over time, people also wanted to see less and less matching. And at some point, it was more like me saying, before we forget about it completely, I think I don't think it's useless. You should still also learn about matching. So I shifted the weights within my course, but I gave yeah probably 25 of these short courses between five and 30 hours um, yeah. all across Europe. Wow. So this was, these were basically causal inference workshops. Yeah, exactly. And I was always using these slides, Ikino slides. Yeah. Then uh -huh. I added more and more of my own, but that yeah. was the starting point. And yeah. only then at some point, the mostly harmless book came out. And then I said, okay, here are my lecture notes. You will see they are whatever, 90% overlap with <laughs> the uh, Angus uh, Pischke book. But, yeah. um, and then I would point them to the book essentially, but um, the, the core were these lecture notes uh, that yeah, yeah. you know, I developed. That's great. So did you ever think about writing up the lecture notes into a book? Nah, after, well, early on when there were only these lecture notes and no Angus Pischke book, I was maybe tempted, but I was on kind of tenure track. I needed yeah. to get papers published. I didn't want to waste time uh, working on a textbook. Right. And then once the Mostly Harmless book came out, I felt there was no point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I never did. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's amazing. Uh, that's th that conf that is the first time I have heard anyone confirm this hunch that I've had for a long time, which was uh, causal inference spread more through the applied community than it did through the econometrics textbooks. Uh, that's great. Well, so so you were were you. Uh, doing economic history in graduate school? Did that end up being in your dissertation? No, the, the crazy thing is I never in my life attended an economic history lecture. Uh -huh. um, and the, the reason for that is at Bonn, where I did my undergraduate, there was no economic historian. The only thing we had was history of economic thought, but there was yeah. no economic history. And also again in Florence at the European University Institute, there was no economic history. So I never sat in an economic history until this day, really. Mm. Um, and how did I end up working on history topics? So really in my PhD, I I was a labor economist. Yeah? Yeah. So my PhD thesis was looking at job displacement, the cost of job displacement. And I was doing some stuff on returns to education. Um, then we we had been working with Ikino on a paper on this phenomenon in most Southern European countries that young people move out from home very late. Yeah, in Italy wow. back in the day, the uh, median age of moving out from home was larger than thirty. So uh, really? especially young men would stay at home forever, and even after they moved out. They live within a few kilometers from their mom, yeah, and that was a topic that fascinated us. So all of that was laborish labor. Yeah. Um, is that more of a so male? Is that more of a male phenomenon, or even females? Even females, the average age of moving out is much higher than in Northern Europe. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I interrupted you. Keep going. Yeah. So how did I end up? today at least, working mostly with historic data. That was following advice by Ikino, hmm. my PhD advisor, with many years delay, I remembered a sentence he said. So this uh, paper in the QJE that I have with Ludger Wösmann on um, the Protestant ethic or the alternative to the Protestant ethic in terms of human capital theory was an idea that Lutka and I, my co-author, had been bouncing around for several years, somehow thinking, okay, what is it, this Protestant ethic? It, it sounds very fluffy. 
how would yeah. you even measure a Protestant ethic? This is this is Weber. Well, this is, is this is like the, the Weber. Hy- this yeah. is the Weber yeah. hypothesis. Yeah, that's the Weber hypothesis. Yeah. Right. So we both grappled a bit with even the concept of the Protestant ethic, and at the same time, I guess both Ludger and I uh, are churchgoers. He's Catholic. I went to a different church. Um, we thought, well, isn't it that Martin Luther, Martin Luther, translated the Bible to German, and he said that is a quote we had in mind that everyone should be able to read the Bible. Yeah, and he said that at a time in the early 16th century when literacy rates were maximum 10 percent. Yeah. And then making that statement, everyone should be able to read the Bible by themselves, sounds like yeah. completely mad. Yeah? Mm. But that was a call to a public education program, yeah. more or less. Yeah? Yeah. And so we thought, well, assume this call by Luther really had consequences, then couldn't it be that Protestants are more educated earlier on in history and that that then translates into higher incomes and that's and that it's not so much that protestants work harder and save more for the future but that they are more educated yeah right right so that was the idea and then we thought well how would we go about that how would we convince readers uh, of a causal effect if we were to go to modern day data year 2000 something, then in in any Western country, we've by now had various waves of migration, atheism is on the rise. So we have so many different religious groups, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Jews, atheists, Buddhists. How would we ever find an instrument um, to figure this out if there are these multiple groups? So then I remembered a statement by Ikino, who always told his students, um, if you have an idea, uh, you should always ask yourself, if I could go to the fairy queen and wish for data, what would it be? Mm. Uh, And even if that data that you wished you had doesn't exist, that is your reference point of what the perfect quasi experiment would look like. Yeah. So then we had this discussion, okay, modern day data year 2000 something, maybe we would struggle to make a causal inference case. So probably we have to dig further back in time and try to find historic data. Yeah. Um, Because in our naive thinking, and today I think about these issues differently, 100, 200 years ago, everyone was religious. Yeah. So, and at the same time, there were essentially only Catholics and Protestants and a small Jewish minority, but all these other complications, atheists didn't exist. So we deliberately started searching for historic data without ever having, having, having been to an archive before, yeah, because we both weren't trained economic historians. So we started Googling around for data, census data, we had no clue. So I I also sent emails to the most famous German economic historians of the day, 15 years ago, and asked them, okay, are you aware of any data source in Germany for say the 19th century or even earlier 18th century, 17th century, where you have both religious denomination, schooling and income, yeah? And uh, they all came back saying, yeah, we think you only have such data at the aggregate level, but not regionally disaggregated. We've never come across anything like that. And that sounded like a bummer. Yeah? And then we parked the idea. But every now and then I would just Google again, hoping that at some point something pops up. Yeah? What were you and looking then- for? What, were, what was it that you were looking for? Exactly. I, we, we just felt it has to be at least data disaggregated to the county level so right. that we have hundreds of units of observations as opposed ah. to something very aggregated. Yeah? yeah. 
And then one night I Googled again and found something from a village close to Berlin, a hobby historian had ah. written up the city history or the village history and said, according to the census of 1871, our little village had 50 inhabitants, 30 Catholic, 20 Protestant, and 40 could read and write and 10 couldn't. And then I thought, yes, yeah. So we went out, dug out this census. That census, the 1871 census is what? Yeah, and all of that, yeah, meant that was the starting point of us using historic data. Ah, ah. so keep going. So then you get that. What what do you get? What do you find when you get that 1871 census? So what we then show in that paper is that indeed uh, in Protestant areas, literacy rates are higher. Um, and also then we found other census type data on occupational shares. So we found that in Protestant areas, there are more people working in manufacturing and services as opposed to agriculture. Uh-huh. So these areas seem to be more developed. There's an earlier move out of an agricultural society. Mm. And that were essentially the main pieces of, of that work. Yeah, Religion mm-hmm. seems to predict uh, literacy and also seems to predict economic outcomes, economic success. And yeah. here we go with an alternative story for the same facts that right. Weber served. Right. And may all be just explained by human capital as opposed human capital. to in a work ethic. Right, yeah. right. Wait, so it, it is the testable prediction also that you'll find these higher rates of literacy amongst the Protestants, but not the Catholics? Or is it a more general christian thing um well we just contrast protestants and catholics yeah because oh you do yeah yeah. you find the higher rates of literacy amongst the protestants protestants yeah wow 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 what was the reaction amongst you know historical and religious you know experts what was their reaction to this i mean it's been a hundred years since Weber, but it's still Um, a well-known theory well, some pushback came on one end from Weberians. There was this whole group of people for whom Weber is a god. Yeah. And, uh, if you criticize him, you must have misunderstood him. <laughs> right. But uh, there were some guys who would say, ah, no, 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 you are misrepresenting Weber. He never said what you claim he said. So there was a bit of this. Yeah. Um, then among say more reformation historians yeah there was a bit of an outrage how dare you pool data from all across germany you are not giving a due uh, diligence to understanding the micro history of this city and that city you know uh, because historians often want to f- understand in every single detail one small geographic unit and for them it's outrageous if you try to make uh, average statements across hundreds of geographic units right 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 that must have been uh it it seems like give it's not your first history paper though right because i thought i saw you have something on luther and female education in the 19th century a little bit earlier, but I know the publication lags can make this yeah. show up at different times. Did, did you work on the Protestant paper uh, before the QJE before that Luther paper, or is it, what's the, what's the connection? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, this 2008 paper with the title Luther and the girls uh, was conceived later. Yeah? Ah, Okay. But there was a special issue of the Scandinavian Journal of Economics edited by Alan Kruger, of all people. Oh, um, wow. And we submitted it there. And since that was a special issue, the review process was super quick. Like we sent it, we got reports, we had X weeks to put in a revision. And suddenly this thing appeared in, I think, December 2008. And from that point on, because we use the same instrument that we use in the QJE paper, and the QJE paper was also submitted at the same time, mm. we were a bit nervous that some referee or barrow would say, oh, wait, you've used this instrument before. This is right. no longer novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're hoping the they're not. 
the, yeah. the real order had been that the QJE paper was conceived much earlier and right. the one that got published earlier was a spin-off. Yeah. 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 Their instrument is, uh, is it distance to the, uh, the printing press? Is that the, the instrument or what, what's no, the distance to Wittenberg? So distance to the, the cradle of the reformation. So where Martin Luther was a professor at the university. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's distance to basically Luther. Yeah. Distance to Luther. Yeah. Huh? Huh? So because what you're, you're using the, the, I actually don't know the, the history of the spread from Luther, but is it, it's just basically you're able to document that conversion to Protestantism is sort of based on that geography. It's just based on the distance to Luther. Yeah. So what we did back then was really quite simple. We, we produced maps of the share of Protestants in mm -hmm. 1871. So 350 years after the reformation mm. and it struck us that somehow everything within 200 miles around Wittenberg seemed to be Protestant. Mm -hmm. And then there were some areas that seemed to be 50, 50 Catholic yeah. Protestant. Yeah. And then beyond that, everything seemed to be Catholic. So that yeah. made us think, oh, wow. Um, maybe there is, some spread concentrically yeah. around the cradle of the reformation about uh, Luther city. Yeah. And so that's how we uh, went about it. Um, but we did not really document the actual spread per se, but we had yeah. this map in 1871 and it seemed to correlate with distance and that gave birth to that instrument. In the meantime, yeah. with other co-authors, we've written papers, one published three years ago, one in the making, where we really show the micro spread. Um, ah. yeah. Is that and, well known and, amongst and the history? Yeah. Is that well known amongst the the Reformation scholars? Do they sort of appreciate that geographic uh, component? Um, yes and no. There, there is a bit this um, saying that yeah, Luther's influence was strongest in the vicinity of Wittenberg mm. yeah, because he was at the time already a, a papal bull had been issued against him in yeah. 1520. So the Pope wanted to stop him from having more influence. So at some point he was geographically constrained in oh, his travels. Yeah. He stuck and then in that area. He yeah. could exercise more influence nearby, but not yeah. so much further away. Oh um, yeah. But what we are doing now in this ongoing work is to document also his correspondence. So thousands of mm. letters have survived. Um, incoming letters, outgoing letters to various cities. Um, we also know which students studied with him in Wittenberg, who Get then out of here. afterwards would go back home and spread the news about the Reformation. And so we can now more carefully document what back in that QJE paper was merely a statistical exercise, so to say. Wow, wow. So does this does this project with the that turned into the QJE, is this responsible for this big uh part of your life now of being an economic historian and then focused even on the religion part? Yeah, yeah. So the, the way I typically tell the story is it's all uh, Robert Barrow's fault. So in, uh, in the first revision, we only had, I think, one outcome variable, this share of manufacturing and services um, as a measure of economic development. And then Barrow said something like, um, this is all nice, but we need to see it's robust. You need to show us for many more different outcomes that you find the same result and that it's not just a fluke in the data. So we went and collected additional outcomes. We collected tax statistics, uh, uh, wages of the poor. Uh, we collected all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And then Barrow wrote something like, um, I see this is robust. This can go in a footnote. Um, <laughs> and then we have this footnote, I don't know, footnote 44, where we say, we also looked at blah, 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 blah. And I always say this footnote 
is worth twenty thousand dollars. So. <laughs> Because digitizing this data, blah, 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 cost us. It was a complete nightmare. <laughs> um, but then we suddenly had all these data sitting on our drive uh -huh. that only were buried in a footnote. Right. And we thought, what else could one do with this data, you know? And then yeah. there it slowly spread. Yeah. So Bar Barrow, the same way the Pope pushed luther in a particular direction barrows and that footnote has pushed you in a particular direction yeah yeah barrow yeah. made the economic historian and i think he doesn't even know <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh well one of the papers i saw last year you know uh when we when we were at that conference together uh, i saw you present just this really fascinating paper and i was curious if we could talk a little bit about it um this uh, national socialism and Christian names paper. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about that paper? Because there's lots of parts to it that are really interesting. Yeah. So funnily, it is in my head quite related to the the Weber paper in yeah. the following sense. So I think what I learned over time is that my naive thinking that in the middle ages everyone was religious was right. nonsense yeah oh everyone may have been member of a church yeah. and even in the 1920s 99 percent of people in the census are either catholic or protestant or jewish because the category the statistical category of being without religious denomination didn't exist. Yeah, maybe in 1925, there was then uh, for the first time a category for it. And 1% of the population declared themselves with the, without a church affiliation. Mm -hmm. But for sure, not everyone was like a diehard Pentecostal type uh, yeah. Christian. Um, so then also looking back, even at Martin Luther's own writings, he, 20 years into the Reformation period, he wrote that uh, he was really concerned about the future of the church. And one reason he wanted to reform it and change the Catholic Church into something better was that he was concerned that Christianity could die. Yeah? Ah. So what they did in the Protestant areas um, is to send out uh, people from Wittenberg to do church visitations. Yeah? So they would send them to the countryside, to the local parish. They would talk to the pastor, they would talk to the members of the congregation, and they would ask them basic stuff like, what are the four evangelists in the New Testament? Yeah? And then I should say Matthew, Luke, John, uh, Mark. Mm -hmm. yeah? And they often came back and they said, the pastor didn't know any of this. Yeah. Uh -huh. they, they were just completely shocked that there is someone who is supposed to teach the flock um, the Christian basics and has no clue, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then there is some work out there um, that, or it has been known for decades when it comes to Nazi voting, because the paper you just talked about is about the rise of Hitler. Um, it has always been known that the strongest predictor of Nazi voting, the single strongest predictor in a kind of machine learning prediction exercise sense, is Protestantism. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Now, that could be that Protestants are just nasty people. Yep. They are all anti-Semitic and the Catholics are good people. Right. Or it could mean something different. It could mean something deeper. And then we start to think, okay, well, where did Protestantism ultimately succeed? Well, it, it succeeded more in the, in the northeast of Germany than in the south of Germany. And that makes, makes you think about, well, how did even Christianity spread? Yep. Um, well, in the Roman Empire, which cut Germany in two parts. Um, it spread by word of mouth. Yeah. But then outside the Roman Empire, the world's 
remained pagan for a much longer period. Mm. What we then learned over time is that within modern day Germany, whereas in the south, in parts of Bavaria, which is the most staunchly Catholic part of Germany, Christianity arrived before the year 300. But at the mm. Baltic Sea, it arrived in the year 1300. Yeah, so it took 1000 years longer for Christianity to even make it to the north of Germany. Mm. Yeah. And that may have some impact. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, Christianity isn't as deeply rooted. And also what Reformation historians have described is that the Catholic Church wasn't as strong in the north of Germany as it was in the south of Germany. So there was never as much buy in into Christianity per se. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So could it be that Protestantism is not just yet another denomination, but at the same time, it also reflects maybe a more, as we call it, shallow type of Christianity. Yeah? But then, of course, it's not a black and white picture. It's not just Protestant Catholic, but there must be regional variation because there were, were clearly also centers like Wittenberg, Martin Luther's own town, where yeah. Protestantism was strong and kicking. Yeah, but yeah. maybe further away from that in the countryside, um, Christianity per se was just an incidental thing, but not yeah. down uh, in people's thinking. Anyway, so piggybacking on on also work of other people who've shown that, uh, Janet Benson, for instance, that uh, first names often transport family background. Yeah. yeah? Christian parents are more likely to give their kids uh, Christian first names. Um, maybe we can read from that the religious fervor of people. Mm-hmm. And it then turns out that uh, yeah, uh, the religious first names predict uh, Nazi voting. Now, you wouldn't want to write a paper just for that. Uh, we then also collect evidence on surviving pagan cults in parts of Germany based on a huge anthropological survey. And that has a similar flavor that where there is more pagan belief still surviving into the 20th century, also that predicts Nazi voting. And ultimately, we also look at gravestones. And probably when you saw me present this, uh, that didn't exist yet. So on on gravestones, people could have cross or they don't have a cross yeah and uh, having a cross or not may again symbolize and demonstrate whether the family of that person is a christian believer or not and also that is yeah 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 well so what's the big the big idea in this paper are you just trying i mean the the i would think actually that first stage or whatever of predicting uh voting for national socialism is you said it's the the name the the christian name yeah it would be like it would be what like john or david or something what, what would it yeah be? exactly exactly um a, a so biblical what, name. what is the bigger question the bigger question is um there is work on political religions um uh-huh. and so what I told you is, so to say, what is the statistical relationship that we are exploring? But what is looming in the background is the fact that the Nazis um, used religious language to refer to their own party. Yeah? So Hitler is usually described as the savior of the German people. The Nazi greeting, where they would raise the, the right arm and uh, is Heil Hitler, Salvation Hitler. Ah. Hitler would give speeches and end them with Amen. Um, we would. Church. Um, oh. Amen. Yeah. Um, there were all kinds of religious symbols. The swastika yeah. in, in German is called Hakenkreuz, so a cross with uh, a bend. Yeah. Uh, so the, the word cross is in it. Yeah. Um, they had all kinds of ceremonies that that have the flavor of religious ceremony. Yeah. And someone who is a, a deep rooted Christian may yeah. 
probably find that outrageous that yeah. there is someone who claims to be the savior right yeah? right that's if christianity is only an outer veneer but not yeah. really something heartfelt maybe you find that more appealing yeah 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 it's a cult that's very cult like i mean in yeah, the yeah. in the united states the the cult leaders will claim that kind of uh that you know around where i live david koresh the uh cult leader uh in the 90s that's what he 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 would talk that way not the yeah. racism part i don't know but wow that's fascinating uh huh well so i mean have you completely sorted into economic history to the exclusion of that original um, labor. I mean, there's a lot of human capital all throughout what we've been talking about. So have you sort of, but are you, do you, do you sort of self-identify your research agenda mainly in history now, or is it, does is it spread over lots of different things? Um, no, I've always worked on several things and often at the same time. Um, yeah. because I also often get bored if I work on the same topic for too long. So in the past few years, I've done some work on Brexit um, mm. to get over the referendum result in, in the UK. I wanted to understand it better. Yeah. Um, I, I'm doing stuff on labor market still. So I had some work on a correspondence test, mm -hmm. trying to see whether employers discriminate against women based on fertility. Yeah, or expected fertility. I'm still doing a follow up project on that. So I, I, I think it's still a mix of labor economics, political economy and economic history. Yeah. But these weights from year to year shift a little bit. But right. probably right. the um, the most prominent stuff uh, is the economic history side of things. But yeah. my heart still beats also for labor economics and for yeah. political economy. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I know this is an impossible question, but I'm just sort of curious if you're able to do it. If I could like talk to your co-authors, if I could talk to your, you know, Aquino and just, and they, and they could, you know, step as far, sort of step at a distance and look at you and uh, they could sort of collaborate and say, you know, I, I think the reason Sasha is as successful of an economist you know, is in terms of his scholarship and his in, and and per, being able to produce at this high level, I think it's because he's like this, you know, like this this kind of secret, you know, uh, the the unobservable, you know. What what would they? What do you think people would say? And you know, I know you're modest, so you probably aren't comfortable. But like, if you had to, if people, if you could just sort of describe what what sort of makes you different or what makes you know what is it that has has made it so that you are able to write papers consistently over your career over and over and over again in a way that you know you you have what what's what's the secret so first of all i don't think that in by any metric i'm extremely successful but maybe given the humble beginnings in a house with no academics in it, I have got to a point that I myself thought I could never get to. So I'm deeply thankful to the people along the way who made that happen and the many coincidences, people just being nice and supportive and inspiring me. I think what people might say is that I I read quite widely and I myself think of myself mainly as a social scientist. Yeah. Mm. So I, I, I'm I'm the complete opposite of being tribal. Yeah. yeah. So um, I hate tribalism. Mm. And hopefully people enjoy working with me because I have a passion for staff and I may have quirky ideas sometimes mm -hmm. um, drawn from reading completely seemingly unrelated stuff. Yeah? Yeah. Um, but I've always found that 
the only way new research can flourish is if you do it slightly differently than what would be expected. Mm. Uh, you have to bring together different things. I've all my career, I've worked with historians, hardcore historians. Um, I'm working, I enjoy working with sociologists. Uh, mm. it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's giving me so much uh, because they, they read completely different literatures. They think so differently about the world and only that can make you think differently. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. these relationships may be, they also gain from me having read other stuff that they do. And yeah, I, I think I'm passionate about what I do. That's yeah. the yeah, one yeah, yeah. thing. Uh, topics are often close to my heart. Yeah, like mm. the work I've been doing on the persecution of Jews, anti-Semitism and so on. I really feel strongly about these things. Mm. Yeah. I want to understand them because I want to, I would love the world to be a better place. Yeah. And right. understanding on the one hand, why do people do such atrocious stuff is yeah. something that drives me at the same time. I'm now doing work on the righteous among the nations. So people who uh, helped rescue Jews, I want to understand what, what makes people be willing to put their own life on the line to rescue the life of someone else. Yeah? Mm, mm. Anyways, I, I want to understand human nature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it has been so nice talking. Um, I have one more unusual question, and uh, uh, and then I know I've kept you for a long time. I, I want you to imagine, if you could, if you could go back in time and talk to that uh, assistant professor that was you or the graduate student that you'd been, and maybe you, you know, he, he doesn't recognize you. He obviously can't imagine that his future self would be coming back in time. And, but you sit down and you, you meet him and you're having coffee at a coffee shop and, you know, you're talking to him and you're listening to him, but you also kind of share with him. What do you, what do you think, you'd really wish you could go back and tell that young person, you know, if you had a day or so to be with him, what do you really wish you could go back and tell him now that you're sort of, you know, 20, 30 years later, uh, that you really feel like would be sort of valuable to a young person like that, like you were. I think the biggest mistakes in my academic life were in the first two or three years after the PhD. Mm. I didn't send out several papers of my PhD thesis um, mm. uh, out of a mix of perfectionism and uh, thinking I need to work on something else because that's more exciting. Yeah? So mm. I, I think wasted several papers of my PhD thesis that could be published even if maybe not in a super top journal, but they could be published. And I would have learned so much in the submission process ah. that was delayed. And I think doing that since I was on a non tenure track position, mm. I even put the economic well being of my family on the line. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I was married, we had two kids. And there I was. And after five or six years, I had the Stata journal. Yeah. and one European economic review and an economics bulletin. So I had three publications and maybe one of them in a decent journal. Um, and my career was about to run against the wall. Um, mm. And then that QJE R&R came through and yeah. that changed my life forever. But uh, this was all my fault. There was mm. stuff sitting on my hard drive in my desk drawer that I never submitted and what mm. an idiot I was. Yeah? yeah. And that's the one thing I keep telling junior colleagues when I, to, I have mentorship meetings and I also keep telling my students, don't do the Sasha thing, but send your stuff out. Yeah. If yeah. you never submit, you never get an acceptance. Right. Yeah? Right. 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 Wow. Wow. 
And that's you think you you think uh, that's because that's kind of correlated even with your success a little bit the passion, the working on things that you love, working on things you're excited by. The the flip side of that might be uh, the 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 like drudgery of uh, sending out stuff that you're not excited. You sort of maybe had to. It's like there's this. They kind of come together a little bit. Yeah, probably yes. Because yeah, I mean we all we all know that there is always still yet another thing you might do to yeah. make it rounder and more complete. Um but also on that one, one barrow quote on a different person. There there was a person who had been working on a topic for years and had collected ninety percent of the data. And everyone in the profession knew about that person working on this topic. And that person was also a perfectionist. And he only wanted to submit the paper when he had collected data for 100% mm. of the countries in the world. And he only had 90%. And he never submitted. Yeah? Yeah. And then at some point, other people collected the same data and submitted with 90% of the data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfectionism can kill um also moving things forward for the benefit of society not just yeah. for your own personal career but yeah. at some point you have to call it a day and submit that doesn't mean that you submit half-baked stuff but uh perfectionism is the enemy of the good yeah 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 that's great well, Sasha, I have thoroughly enjoyed this uh, talk. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, it's so, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Well, you have a great uh, day. And uh, I guess it's day for you, right? It's the end of my day, but it's it's your day's exactly, start. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have a great day. You have a great afternoon and evening. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. I guess, Doc. Bye-bye. you.